So uh, good afternoon, uh, everyone. Uh, on behalf of my colleagues here in Arctic, uh, I would like to welcome you all to this uh, webcast. Uh, my name is Truls Wiel from our corporate finance team, and I'll be moderating this session today. Uh, first of all, we naturally hope that you all are healthy, safe, and as sound as you can be when uh, working from home. Uh, and we know that the complexities uh, most of you are experiencing when uh, both the markets are collapsing and the operational challenges are piling up. We're therefore very grateful that you're able to participate on the call today. Uh, for us in Arctic, we have fairly quickly adopted to the new working environment as most of us are working from home uh, while we're still keeping a, a good physical staff here in our offices. Uh, there's no doubt that the current turmoil has had a severe impact on a lot of our ongoing transactions. Uh, but despite the current market volatility, we're also very pleased that we have supported clients and we've also been able to close both ECM, DCM and M&A transactions within the past couple of weeks. The objective of the call today is to offer a structured review of what we observe at the macro level, uh, but also try to explain what's happening in the oil market and the possible implications it might have for the OSV and subsea sectors. For sake of good order, we will not be focusing on any specific companies or stocks on this call, uh, and we request you to reach out to our research team if you're interested in that type of analysis. It's fair to say that um, it's extremely challenging to make good projections in today's market, but we have a few brave colleagues who will try to do their best and offer their views and opinions. I'll therefore shortly leave the world to Stein Brun, who will take us through the macro picture, Ure Richard Hammer, who will talk about the oil market, and Svein Alvesta, who will be talking about the OSV and uh, subsea sectors. As we have a few hundred participants and more than 100 companies participating on the call today, uh, primarily owners, operators, investors, banks, and all other industry stakeholders, there will only be a Q&A session at the end. If you have any questions, we kindly request you to try and click the bottom at the left-hand side uh, in your screen. Um, and we hopefully should be receiving the questions uh, at our screen and will uh, take questions at the end of the call. We aim to conclude this session in one hour, um, and there will also be an opportunity to have follow-up calls with our research team if there are specific topics that you would like to discuss in further details. So I think on that note, I'll leave the virtual scene to the capable hands of our chief economist, Mr. Steinbrun. Thank you, Jules. Uh, <clears throat> this will obviously be a rather brief run through on the macroeconomic impacts, uh, but let me first start with a sort of a disclaimer. When you're in the midst of a storm, you shouldn't really draw the most bold conclusions for long-term long -term implications, like calling the end of the US status as a fiscal superpower 10 days after uh, Lehman Brothers filed for bankruptcy. That said, this, we, the global economy is already in recession, and uh, this recession will be probably, the, at least in the short term, the deepest we have seen ever. And much deeper than than the the height of the global financial crisis 11 years ago, 11 12 years ago. At that time, the, the deepest quarterly contraction in global GDP was 1.5 percent. Uh, my rough estimate is that uh, the U.S. and Eurozone probably will see GDP declining by some 5 6 percent in sequentially in the second quarter. Uh, Actually, Eurozone was in recession in, in, at the start of the year already, due in particular to, to, uh, to uh, uh, Italy. Uh, Chinese GDP was sharply lower in the first quarter, uh, and, and uh, uh, the US will follow up in the, in the current quarter. If you go to the next uh, slide, please. Thank you. So, we, despite all this, uh, extremely uh, widespread countermeasures uh, in the form of fiscal uh, stimuli uh, and also um, monetary policy stimuli on, on multiple fronts in, in the form of rate cuts, liquidity to support, backstopping credit markets, uh, uh, the Fed uh, stating that they will buy uh, every uh, unlimited uh, of, of US treasuries, the ECB will buy more than all the net issuance of uh, government uh, bonds in the Eurozone this year. Uh, despite all these countermeasures, uh, <clears throat> we certainly are in for a, a rather rough time. And, and the discussion already is already whether it will be a V-shaped form of, of uh, 
of, of the recovery or a U, U, U shaped form. I think the, this discussion is a little bit premature. So certainly, we have a number of arguments uh, favoring a more uh, a drawn out uh, bottoming of, of the, the global economy. And certainly, you could, you could say that with the, with the, the US seeing this uh, very high jobless numbers coming out earlier today, uh, we will see a, a, a very sharp uh, uh, increase in, in US unemployment, which sort of could draw up, draw up the, 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 the trough of the cycle. But, but bear in mind that actually a V-shaped recovery is actually the, the, the norm over the, over the years. If you go to the next chart, please. Uh, we have always seen uh, um, that the, the, the service sector has been hit hard. Uh, naturally, uh, when we are restricting traveling, restrict, restricting uh, uh, transport, we are restricting uh, part of household services, business services, and also uh, lockdowns are causing people to, to shop less than they used to be. Certainly, the, the service sector is taking uh, <clears throat> the hardest hits uh, in the short term. And uh, the most updated indicators for that sector is this purchase and management indexes, which we had uh, the preliminary uh, March readings of last week. And they saw, they, they, uh, we saw that there was a record steep decline in some countries, especially in, in the Eurozone, but also in, in the US uh, with, with uh, this uh, uh, measures deep into contraction uh, territory. So far, uh, in a relative sense, so far, the impact on the manufacturing sector has been more modest. Uh, admittedly, we had a, a very steep uh, drop in in, uh, in Chinese um, manufacturing output in uh, the January uh, February period due to uh, extensive shutdown of uh, factories, uh, and that that caused the, the global uh, manufacturing uh, purchase and management index to to drop sharply in in uh, February. Uh, seemingly, uh, there was some stabilization in March. We had this March PMIs for manufacturing out yesterday and actually uh, firmed uh, slightly, but that was only due to an extreme strong rebound in, in, in China, where, where factories are reopening, but obviously not uh, uh, operating at, at normal capacity. So for the rest of the world, we, we saw uh, the rest of the world in manufacturing sector is in a deeper contraction than in, in February, and certainly there's more to come uh, with this uh, uh, demand indicators showing a, a, a showing a very steep decline. Next, please. Uh, so we have every indicator that uh, indicated uh, indicators for for uh, the U.S. and the Eurozone to already be in recession um, and certainly getting worse to the second quarter. Much of this will depend on uh, uh, this widespread uh, countermeasures put in place to to try to stem the the, the, the spread of the coronavirus. Uh, and certainly making any uh, forecast uh, it's like shooting on a, on a moving target because we saw yesterday and today that they are extending these lockdowns in in uh, in, uh, in in Spain and in Germany and uh, almost by the day uh, more widespread lockdowns in in the US so so when I'm stating that when I've stated that uh, GDP in the US and the US might decline by five, some five six percent in the current quarter certainly that uh, is marked with uh, a lot of uncertainty. Next, please. Uh, so, uh, at the same time, uh, we are seeing that uh, China is, is coming back. And actually, uh, the recovery in China, which will be rather strong in the second quarter, will dent the, the, the blow uh, to, 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 to global uh, GDP in the, in, in the current quarter. Actually, global GDP due to China, which is accounting for some almost 20% of global output uh, due to China, we might see a, a, a small decline in global GDP in the second quarter than in the first one. Next one, please. Um, visibility on economic, uh, on the short-term economic outlook is poor, and that's mainly due to, and it's depending on the depth and, and the duration of this coronavirus uh, outbreak. And if you look on the, 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 the daily numbers, we are seeing that outside China, where the, where the outbreak is more or less contained, uh, certainly you have some risk for a, a second round uh, outbreak, but more or less contained in, in China. And ex-China, the, the daily increase is, is still very rapid. Um, 
over the past few days, uh, actually uh, some uh, acceleration. acceleration. Uh, but at the same time, we are also seeing signs that the secondary derivative has started turning in a number of countries, as you will see on the right hand side. Uh, first of all, obviously, uh, mainland in China, but also Korea, uh, where they had a, a decline in active cases. Active cases is total confirmed cases uh, minus deaths and minus recoveries in, in, in Korea has actually been declining since midst of, uh, of March. And we're also seeing that the, the rate of increase has slowed quite a bit in, in uh, a number of European countries. Next, please. Uh, <clears throat> next, please. The, the main uncertainty these days are what's happening in, in the US. And a key reason why why you has, has become the epicenter of this coronavirus outbreak is that they were rather late in starting testing people. Uh, the fact is that Korea and the US had the first confirmed case at the same day in January, January the 20th. Uh, but it was uh, to the second or third week in, 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 uh, in March before uh, um, uh, US started to, to, to roll out the test in earnest. So over the past few weeks, um, we have gone from a uh, uh, number of confirmed cases in the US was below 10,000 actually, uh, only two and a half a week ago, and it's now running above 200,000. And certainly uh, they, they have to, let's that, make uh, a lot of uncertainty on the, concerning the duration of the outbreak and also the implications for markets. So I think that the main focus these days are on are on, on on the US. Next, please. At the same time, we do have some positive news out of Europe. First of all, the rate of increase has, has slowed quite a bit, and the recovery rate has been uh, increasing over the past, say, ten days. Uh, for the for some of the main European uh, uh, countries, the recovery rate is is up to twenty percent, and is going to, to to increase further in the coming days. And if you go to the next slide, uh, I will actually make the case that Italy will be peaking in terms of active cases within the next week. As of that will be a, a marker uh, both for, uh, for, for authorities and also for markets. Uh, and probably the next out will be Germany, uh, where the inflow of new infections, in new net, net inflow of new infections are are, are, have come down uh, quite uh, sharply. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Stein. Uh, Oli Hammer here taking over, talking about uh, uh, the oil market, which which uh, certainly uh, is at the epicenter of of, uh, of the crisis because we all, we have a twin crisis in the oil market with a supply increase on top of uh, uh, the demand increase. And it, as in any uh, down cycle uh, in in oil, the question is always how low and for how long is this going to last? And we tend to be blinded by the darkness, as we say here, with with a lot of negative info at the present. Uh, and uh, our conclusions and the, the thoughts we want to share with you today uh, is that we believe this down cycle is going to be relatively short lived. Uh, we think it's going to play out in a relatively similar way as the, the oil crisis we've seen over the past 20 years, uh, which all have been, been relatively short lived. So in, in that sense, uh, we believe that while the, the twin shocks certainly are dramatic, uh, we believe it's the end of a down cycle. It's not the start of a new one. Uh, and why do we think that? Well, primarily because we believe the foundation for a prolonged price slump are not in place. We believe the underlying um, demand drivers are quite strong. We don't see it there. Uh, we think supply, uh, the supply growth was slowing before the crisis, it's going to slow and uh, even further now. So we don't see it there and we don't see uh, the spare capacity overhang uh, needed to keep prices low for a, a long period of time. In, uh, quite the contrary, we actually believe that this, the seeds are being sown 
uh, as we speak for a new uh, upcycle, primarily driven by a counter shock on the supply side. You could see uh, our price assumptions at the bottom, $40 for this year, $50 for next year. Uh, we call it estimates. Uh, I'm, I'm sure uh, somebody also will call it guesstimates. It's a period of high uncertainty, uh, but we feel uh, comfortable with our cyclical outlook that we are closer to, uh, this is the end of the, of the uh, down cycle. It's not the start, uh, uh, start of a new one, uh, and we will go for a cyclical recovery. So let's have a look at some of, of uh, the arguments uh, and the fundamentals we're focusing on. Um, this graph, it's a, uh, it's a demand supply balance um, uh, going back some time. The, the uh, light blue line going up is the, is the supply line, and the, but the most dramatic one, of course, is the dark blue line going, going down. Uh, we've drawn a couple of lines here uh, on, on the demand side, essentially to reflect the extreme level of uncertainty. Uh, two weeks ago, we thought uh, you know demand may be down three, four million barrels per day. Uh, certainly, uh, almost every day I get into the office, there's a new demand forecast. We're now looking at uh, a much lower level, uh, and we think we're looking at a, a, a drop here into the second quarter of about 10 million barrels per day. And with with supply going up at the same time, uh, currently. Um, we, we're probably dealing with a double digit uh, oversupply uh, uh, situation in the market. Um, now, uh, um, some of you, I'm sure, have seen uh, other numbers that are more extreme, talking about 15, uh, maybe 20 million barrel per day drop. Uh, we are not there yet. And why is that? Well, num number one, uh, uh, we think that um, and the, the, the second quarter is going to be the nadir of the demand cycle, in our view, because that's when we will get the maximum amount of drop from, from the US uh, and for, uh, from Europe, and certainly the US with a very strong, uh, relatively strong first quarter. That's going to be a real cliffhanger into the second quarter. But don't forget, as Stein was saying, uh, China is ahead of the game and Asia, they are ahead of the game. They are starting to exit from the most acute problems. So economic activity is improving there. Uh, that means our demand will rebound there and that's going to offset some of it. The other key factor uh, in our view is that a double digit demand drop, uh, 10, 15, 20 million barrels per day also implies uh, something akin of a double digit drop in GDP growth. And in our view, we think that's uh, that's unrealistic to, 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 to have that last for more than a month or two. Uh, it becomes a, an acute political problem in our opinion. So we think then the pressure will build to find other solutions. Uh, so uh, we're not expecting this to develop into a full scale depression. Right hand side uh, on the graph, we have uh, demand changes uh, over the past 20 years, uh, including our assumptions on, on, uh, uh, on what we expect this year. So we are at the 4 million barrel per day full year decline, decline for the global market. Uh, as I said, you know, that's not a double digit, uh, uh, double digit decline, but it certainly is a big one. The financial crisis was a 1 million barrel per day decline. And at 4 million, we are matching the biggest one year decline we have in oil market uh, statistics, which is 4% back in 1979. So certainly uh, that accounts uh, for something. Uh, now, uh, we also will note that we have a relatively upbeat view on demand rebound going into next year. And here I think um, history does support this case relatively well. If you look at uh, the, over the past 20 years again, the history of demand rebounding shows that typically the, the rebound in demand is bigger than the preceding drop in demand. Why is that? Well, uh, two reasons. Uh, number one, in the cases where we have a uh, have a uh, have a demand-driven drop uh, in prices, as we do now, governments step typically step in with stimulus packages uh, um, uh, to to support that. Uh, in other cases, when we have a, a supply-driven drop, uh, the, the oil market and oil demand responds to low prices. In this cycle, we have both both the demand shock and the supply shock. So as the tailwinds for those build up, 
uh, we are going to start to see the positive effects. Also, we believe, of course, that, that plenty of the demand which is currently gone from the market is suppressed demand, which will rebound once uh, the, the corona crisis clears, as, as Stein expected, how, how, how we see that clearing. People sitting, perfectly healthy people sitting at home, not allowed to drive and not allowed to move around. A lot of that demand is going to come back. So. The lessons from history is that the rebound in demand tends to be much bigger than the, than the preceding drop. After the financial crisis, we saw uh, saw the, the rebound in demand at the three times that level. And finally, the, the biggest question of all maybe is is what how will demand look post uh, post the corona? Are we going to see uh, huge changes in uh, in economic behavior, etc.? That is a long term challenging question. Our view is that we think uh, uh, and, and tr transportation uh, and consumer habits will prove hard to change, and we will revert to, to back to more, more normal patterns. So at least we are certainly uh, certainly optimistic for for the rebound potential in demand. Uh, but the big story in this cycle definitely is on the supply side of the, of the market. That's where you know, the big changes are going to come and that's what's going to drive what we believe will be the next upturn in oil prices. Uh, currently, we are in an in a extremely depressed situation. Of course, we're seeing oil prices now into the single digits. Uh, we think that this crisis will end the way all other crises end in the oil market. The big producers will make a deal at the end of the day. Uh, to cut production and move prices up to a higher level. We, uh, and we believe all the three big uh, producers in, in the global market have an incentive to raise uh, prices. Uh, and of course, this has to be in very snapshot uh, fashion, but, but in, in short order, uh, we believe with Saudi Arabia uh, uh, will not, not at all be able to compensate for um, uh, uh, for, for the price lost with higher volume, uh, so their budget deficit will uh, will rise sharply. We believe Russia is go, uh, which has led to the ruble slide again, as they uh, as typically tends to happen, will see higher inflation over time, and it will be a tougher tougher, uh, and it, it will bring in the output peak in Russia closer unless prices rise. In our opinion, uh, and we think that the the current situation affecting U.S. shale. Uh, it means that the, the U.S. Rest recession may, may worsen on the employment side in an election year, which is challenging. So we think the, the, um, the assumptions or the, the incentives for all of the three producers to cut the deal are there. However, it's the question of timing as everything else. So, so what we believe needs to be in place uh, is most importantly the corona situation needs to get under control. I think uh, everybody sees that if if, there, if you cut supply in a situation where demand is collapsing, you you risk being left hold, holding the bag of, of uh, lower prices and lower volume, so to speak. So we think that is that is the number one point that, that needs to be in place. Number two, we think that uh, 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 Saudi Arabia certainly would like to see uh, production coming down in other areas, not only in Russia uh, and, 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 uh, and for themselves. So other producers need to contribute. And third, uh, there probably needs to be some political gains to be made for all sides so they can claim victory. Our view is, uh, is that this deal is likely to happen sometime over the next six months. We are somewhat skeptical that it will happen very shortly, although Mr. Trump yesterday, of course, said uh, that, that uh, it could be imminent. Uh, a deal will happen is our main message. Last time it took 14 months for Saudi Arabia and Russia to find out. This time definitely it's going to be quicker in our view. Whether it's going to be in the next couple of days, we're a bit skeptical. But the main view is that, that, that a deal will happen. Uh, then the question is, what will go happen with production in other areas? And here we think uh, that we are uh, already before the crisis, we're heading in the direction of a significant slowdown in global supply growth uh, as a result of, of a, a previous capexes. Now, after after prices have broken down, we believe uh, that uh, the the down the slowdown will turn turn into a downturn. This graph shows the cyclicality of, of, of uh, non-OPEC production uh, growth over time. And uh, uh, as we try to highlight on the, on, on the slide, it typically takes about five years 
for the cutting capex uh, to, to flow through the system to take the growth in non-OPEC production from a peak to a trough. The exception was the, the uh, old 2015-16 uh, cycle, which only had one down year, then the quick rebound to strong growth. That was U.S. shale, of course. Uh, if we look uh, out now, we think that the changes will come quicker than in the last down cycle. The red bars on the right hand is the IEA's forecast. They still see two years of, of pretty strong growth from non-OPEC production before it slows. The blue bars are our assumptions, so we think that, that the um, impact is going to be quite quickly. Uh, in, in particular, we believe that the U.S. shale is going to react quite quickly. We, we look at U.S. shale as having been in contraction for a year already, and production was slowing significantly be, before going into this crisis. Now we think it's going to, to turn down. Last time it took three months from Saudi Arabia's boosted output until U.S. shale already started to, uh, to decline. This situation, we would argue, is significantly more difficult. Then we have a, a number of other uh, countries and or regions which will also find things challenging. Canada is faced with, with the lowest prices. They're already, already trading in, in single digits. Uh, and, uh, and all the, let's say, usual suspects in terms of, of, of basins which have uh, mature production, high underlying depletion, they are vulnerable to, to cutbacks in spending uh, uh, and um, lower investment, whether that's Mexico, North Sea or Brazil. The latter two have been bringing on new output. Uh, there's there's not much more, more new output coming in, uh, and Brazil uh, Petrobras, in fact, have announced uh, have, uh, have announced cutbacks. So our view is that the the sharp drop in prices is now at the level where we're starting to see production get shut in and it's going to impact on the forward growth rates and, and we see uh, oil production declining uh, as a result of this and, and that's what, why, why we're, we're saying that this is uh, the end of a down cycle not the start of a new one so um, that brings us to, to uh, sort of a summary slide here. Uh, we believe, we're firm believers in the old adage that, that the best cure for low prices remains low prices. Uh, demand is collapsing now. Yes, we don't know how long it's going to, uh, low it's going to go, but we firmly believe this is a shock. It's not a structural change. Uh, we think that the supply reaction uh, is going to be uh, faster and bigger than it was in in, uh, in 2015. Th this is an industry now which had not really cleared from the previous down cycle. So, uh, so we, we're kind of sort of riding without safety belts and shock absorbers. That's why that's why we're going to have a, a quicker reaction. And we believe that the big producers are going to cut the deal when the time is right. Our judgment is that it probably is not right currently because the corona situation is still uh, evolving because we're still uh, sort of trying to understand how the supply side is going to be impacted and it's still unclear what kind of uh, political gains can be made for all sides. sides. Uh, we're not political analysts. Our main uh, message is that it will happen. It's uncertain about the timing. Finally, we think that, uh, that prices, when the market turns, Prices will rise despite very high inventories. Uh, they will not be able to hold prices back. They will limit the gains initially, but they will not be able to prevent a turn in the market. So uh, that's our base case view. Certainly a lot of assumptions. Uh, and we are in a very, very difficult uh, market environment in which to navigate. So I'll, I'll finish off with my last slide, which is, uh, you know, what what kind of monitor is, can be, or what kind of uh, market relationships can, can be useful to monitor to understand what's going on. Uh, I pulled up four here. Uh, certainly the list, uh, that, that's not an exhaustive list. You may find others, but I'll take you through the four uh, uh, that we like to watch. Uh, we're big fans of, of watching relative prices. So on the upper left-hand corner, we're looking at the Contango, uh, which, uh, as you all know, has steepened dramatically. Uh, and uh, our takeaway uh, from this one is that as long as the Contango is rising, uh, the oversupply in the market is rising. That's depressive for prices, although that may also at one point bring about the political deal. 
So, the, the, but, but historically, a shift in the contango curve has always signaled uh, a change in the fundamentals. So, that's an important point to, to monitor. Uh, upper right hand corner, we look at refinery margins. Certainly, if refineries aren't making money, they're not going to be buying crude. So, that is something which has to change. We've seen a steep sell off there. Uh, rebound just in the last couple of weeks, still unclear really what's going on. Refiners will probably cut their supply before OPEC cuts theirs. Uh, but but uh, at the end of the day, margins have to improve in order for refiners to start buying. So that's another one. Lower left-hand corner, US rig count. We got the current count uh, on the blue line and uh, plotted against the 2014-2015 count. Um, our take on this is that the, the, the bigger the drop off in the rate count now, the closer we are getting to a, a, a real uh, protracted downturn in the US shale industry, which we believe will make it a political issue uh, and, uh, and put pressure on Mr. Trump and the administration to, to, uh, to cut the deal. So I think that, that is a, a, let's say, a, a barometer of, of uh, how acute the situation is becoming in the US. Finally, uh, we got VLCC rates uh, in the lower right hand corner. Uh, VLCC and uh, overall tanker rates going through the roof, as most of you know. Uh, that's that's the, the reason is is that the, the tankers are now left with having to to deal with the, with the big oil surplus in the market because we're exhausting on land storage. Uh, the reason we'll be watching VLCC rates. Uh, is that that's probably where we will get the first indication of whether the surplus of oil is starting to peak. So a rollover in VLCC rates would to us be a signal that either demand is improving or supply is starting to get cut back. So we think that's an important point. So those are four indicators we're watching, trying to get the signal of what's happening on the ground in the oil market because the signal is going to come there before you can read about it in the paper. So that's important. And I'll close my presentation on that note, hand over to my very capable colleague, Mr. Sveinung Alvestad, to, to talk about uh, World Services. Thank you. Thank you, Ulrika, and good afternoon, everybody. For those of you who don't know me from before, my name is Sveinung Alvestad, and I work with the research department here at Arctic. I'm heading up our coverage of the subsea and offshore support sectors. In addition to that, I use a lot of my time on the top-down macro analysis on the oil and gas industry. In my presentation today, I will give an overview of the current situation, how this compares to the 2014 crisis, and how it is impacting offshore services. Lastly, I will try to give you a roadmap of how we see the market developing in the coming months and years. 2020 started out on the worst thinkable way in the stock markets around the globe. The fast-growing COVID-19 pandemic has triggered stock markets to collapse at magnitudes not seen since the financial crisis in 2008. If that weren't bad enough for the oil industry, the breakdown of the OPEX corporation in early March sent oil prices into the low 20s, down a staggering 70% year-to-date. Hence, we are now having a two-sided crisis where global oil demand is collapsing due to the COVID pandemic and soaring oil supply as Saudi Arabia aims to regain its position in OPEC and crush the U.S. shale industry. These have resulted in oil prices and in oil prices and oil services stocks to collapse. 65 percent of the market cap of the offshore-focused oil service companies have been shaved off since the start of the year. Then the million-dollar question, of course, becomes: How long will the COVID pandemic last, and when will the OPEC deal emerge? The fate of the oil service industry is to a large extent uh, determined by the answer of these two questions. Today's crisis has many similarities to the one we saw in 2014. Back then, the warnings of the downturn already started in 2013, when the oil companies' overspending and growing debt came into focus. This was further intensified when the oil price crashed in the start of 2015, both of these are signals, uh, are elements that we are seeing today. The oil companies' reaction in 2014 was both swift and brutal. New projects were put on hold, all variation orders came under scrutiny, and internal cost programs were initiated. These efforts result in capital spending and operational costs coming down about 50%. 
However, the main thing that differs today is that the industry is much leaner and projects have already been engineered with a fit to purpose solution rather than the gold plating we saw back in 2014. Hence, we believe there is less low hanging fruits today. And as a result of this, reduced spending activity could have greater effect on the oil companies' production profile a couple of years out in time, which Ulrich had covered earlier. As the graph to the top illustrates, the major oil companies have been using more cash on capex, dividend and share buyback than they have generated through the operational cash flow for years. This has historically been accepted by investors as focus has been on reserve replacement ratios and production growth. However, since the 2013-14 crisis, the focus has been on spending within cash flow. After two years with cash surplus, 2019 became yet another year with overspending, despite oil prices averaging at around $64. Given that the year-to-date oil price has been 50 and we have a house view of around 40 for the year, we argue that the oil companies are left with no other choice than to reduce capex and distribution significantly, something we will come back to on the next slide. The graph to the bottom illustrates the flexibility of the oil company's spending budget going forward. We argue that the risk of cancellation on already sanctioned greenfield project is small, as illustrated in the bottom. Uh, while we believe not sanctioned project and expiration campaign are at uh, is at risk, marked in red. In addition, we believe the oil companies have certain flexibility on their brownfield spending, marked in yellow. Hence, we estimate their flexibility to the 2020 spending plan to be around 20 to 30 percent and increasing to 30 to 40 percent in 2021. As discussed on the previous slide, oil companies have already taken action to curtail overspending. Since early March, around 25 offshore focused oil companies have provided an update to the 2020 guidance including all of the majors except ExxonMobil. The response time for these, update, these updated budgets has been surprisingly low, which in, could imply that most of the oil companies have already had contingency budgets in place, in contrast to the 2014 crisis. The weighted average reduction so far has been around 25% from the initial budget, which implies a year-over-year -year spending decline of 20%. As oil companies are reducing their activity significantly, they are suddenly faced with a situation where they are long oil service capacity and consequently are trying to release some of this. As the table shows, the offshore drilling segment is the, se is the most impacted with 10 cancellations so far, totaling around $500 million of backlog. This includes a mix between force majeure situation and cancellation of convenience. We note that the contractual terms is much more in the favor of the oil companies this time around, as there has been little room for a negotiation on term on, for contracts awarded during the challenging market in the past few years. Furthermore, the COVID pandemic and the global shutdown has led to a significant challenges to the supply chains. We have already seen several contracts being terminated on the grounds of force majeure, and as the pandemic is still growing in scale, we cannot rule out that we will see more of this. A simple crew change has become a major challenge for many players due to travel restri restrictions, especially in more remote areas with high share of expats, for example, West Africa. Now let's turn into the different segments and starting off with offshore drilling. The visibility in the offshore drilling segment is at an all-time low. There is currently 128 floating drilling rigs on contract globally, which is slightly up from the bottom in late 2018, but some 50% lower than the peak in 2014. By only looking at committed rigs, the number of rig years for 2020 would fall to 116 and down to 49 in 2021. Hence, in order to see activity at current level, we need to see significant uptick in contracting activity and actually to a level never seen in the industry before. Based on the current environment, we believe contract, act, contract activity is set to be slow and to be, get more clarity on the magnitude of the COVID pandemic and the ongoing oil price war. Hence, 
we should prepare for declining activity levels going forward. Though we do not believe the percentage will fall as severe as it did in 2014, as the drilling contractors are emerging, the are entering the crisis with significantly lower backlogs. As we will discuss la later, this will obviously tickle down to the segments providing services to the rigs as well. Now turning to the subsea industry. The oil company's behavior the past few weeks looks a lot like what we saw back in 2014. The sanctioning of new projects are already being delayed and cost programs are being implemented. The impact during 2014 crisis was that the subsea industry order intake fell by around 60% and remained muted the coming years. When digging into the data, here I exemplified with subsea sevens order intake in the bottom three graph, we find that the orders that dried up first was the large greenfield project, which offshore execution several years out in time, shown in the graph to the right. The next to slow down was the book to turn orders that is executed the same year, typical variation orders and increased scope at the existing contracts, shown in the left graph. While the short cyclical orders illustrated in the middle actually remained relatively resilient down, during the downturn. This is typically subsidy tieback and brownfield project that offers the oil companies a short lead time from sanctioning to cash flow. In our mind, there is two main factors that differs this time around. Firstly, the projects that are being delayed today have already been through one or two rounds with cost reduction and optimization. Secondly, we believe maintenance work is already reduced to a level we find it hard to cut from. Hence, we do not necessarily believe the order intake will fall with the same magnitude as it did back in 2014, but we surely believe the growing trend uh, seen over the past couple of years will be reversed. Next, looking at the construction vessel market. As subsidy com companies order as as subsea companies' order intake fell and backlog started to unwind, the activity for the offshore construction vessel declined as well. The number of vessels operating declined by 35% from the peak in 2014 to the trough in May 17. This and a relatively large new build book sent the total utilization down from 57% to 41% at the trough. However, on the positive note, the construction vessel activity increased by around 30% since the bottom. The lion's share of this increase comes from a growing offshore wind market, which currently consumes 30 construction vessels, which we will look into at the next slide. Offshore wind is nothing new. It has been around for decades. However, change in vessel demand seen over the past few years and uh, been driven by the fact that offshore wind turbines have grown significantly in size and new wind farms tend to be much larger and further offshore than previous wind parks. This has shifted the demand for tonnage towards larger and more sophisticated vessels, which happen to coincide well with the spare capacity we have had in offshore. There is currently around 30 offshore construction vessels operating in the offshore wind market. In addition to this, there are around 20 purpose-built support vessels for the wind market, bringing the total count towards 50 vessels. Going forward, we believe uh, we remain optimistic about the potential in the offshore wind market, and given the planned startup schedule for the coming years, we believe this segment potentially can offset much of the decline expected in the offshore markets. Now turning to the offshore support markets. When looking at the headline numbers for the OSV sector, the oversupply looked massive and it seems like the sector will never recover. However, when digging into the numbers, we become a bit more constructive. Also, please note that this is a global overview of all segments and asset classes. And as we will discuss in a couple of slides, there are surely some asset classes and regions where the supply and demand situation looks much more encouraging than what we are seeing here. The activity has over the past year flattened out and grown, uh, and grown slightly to around 2,000 working PSVs and anchor handlers currently. There are, uh, and we are finally observing that the supply side is coming down. 
There is currently around 3,400 OSV on water. This is 5% less than what we saw at peak. Further, if we adjust for the 900 coal stack vessels, many of which we believe never will operate in the sector again, the utilization actually stands at 82%. This compares to a pre-2014 historical average of around 90%. Given the current situation and what we have discussed earlier, we believe the activity will decline. But we welcome recent announcement for, uh, from companies such as Tidewater and Solstar Offshore, which said that they have initiated additional fleet reduction programs. And we hope that others will follow suit. We have looked a bit closer on the around 900 vessels that currently are coal stacked and we believe the vast majority of these will never come back to operation especially the uh, especially if the stacking period uh, now will be extended by a couple of years as the two graphs illustrates the number of older vessels being stacked is large actually 500 vessels are more than 15 years old and has become more or less obsolete in most of the global markets today also, we believe the cost of bringing back vessels uh, that have been stacked for an extensive period of time will be significant. Hence, by putting these graphs together, we have identified at least 500 vessels that we believe never will operate in the offshore support market again. We believe there is three key factors that has delayed the unavoidable scrapping of these. Firstly, many of the vessels still has debt attached and scrapping those would trigger payment of this. Secondly, the cost of have, having them stacked is relatively low. And finally, the scrap value of the vessels are limited. Actually, in some cases, you may need to, uh, you may need to pay to, to scrap it. As I said initially, there are some asset classes and regions that have specific characteristics that makes them more attractive than the global overview indicates. For example, the high-end tonnage and the locally protected markets such as in Brazil. What we have illustrated here is the high-end PSV market, meaning the vessels with larger than 3,500 deadweight ton. As the slide illustrates, the global demand for high-end PSVs have actually surpassed the 2014 level and utilization has recovered to the mid-70s. Further, further, uh, further, we are observing that the oil companies have been willing to pay a premium for these assets during the downturn as well. The observed rate have actually been at levels that have yielded a decent return when achieving utilization. However, we do not believe this, is, uh, this segment is resilient to the current turmoil either, but we are firm believers that it will weather the next couple of years better than the general OSV market. So in our effort to sum it all up, uh, we have laid out a roadmap with what we believe could be the def different outcomes of the current turmoil. Starting at the bottom with what we call the crash landing. If the pandemic and oil price war drags out in time, we believe the oil price will remain lower for longer, which ultimately could result in years with very challenging market for oil services and ultimately bankruptcies. The, the gradual recovery scenario in the middle calls for the pandemic to be resolved within six to 12 months and a deal within OPEX is struck. If this happens, we believe the oil market will gradually improve, which again will result in a gradual improving oil service market from 2022 and onwards. And lastly, at the top, if we see a solution to the pandemic and the ongoing oil price war within three to six months, we believe oil market could rebalance relatively quickly, which in turn will bring back oil companies' investment appetite and lead to a recovering oil service market during 2021. And then turning to the last slide, the question then becomes, so are we staring into the abyss or is 2020 just another bump in the road? I think the next few months will be critical for oil service industries. 
But given, given the good efforts on containing the current pandemic and Ole Rickard's confidence of our OPEC deal, my best guess would be that we are ending up somewhere in the middle of the roadmap I just provided you with. With that, I want to thank you for your time. Excellent, thank you. So uh, on that note, I think we would like to thank you all for participating in this webcast. There's quite a few questions that we have been unable to answer. So uh, we welcome you all to, to write your questions or, or contact your Arctic representative and we'll be happy to try and give as good answers as practically possible. So thank you all and we wish you a good afternoon.